Ser alle som kommer til danseskolen. Jeg vil ta dette på engelsk, i og med at det er en del engelskspråklige til stede, og jeg tror vi alle kan klare det. Dear everybody, thank you so much for coming here at Nancy School, Nancy Academy. This is one of the open meetings that we have once in a while, two times every month, approximately, where we invite people also from outside of the school to engage in um, in discussions concerning society. And uh, today we are fortunate enough to have Ulla Moon here, who is one of the uh, experts in Norway concerning uh, American politics. And uh, he's going to talk about the constitutions both of uh, the US and Norwegian and the connection between them. So we are looking forward to that. And before Ole will start, uh, Steiner has a few brief remarks concerning uh, Americano studies. I want to point out that Ole is more of a pioneer than he's maybe aware of himself. <laughs> American studies was not a very popular field in Norway. And although the United States, in a way, conquered the world, it's uh, only after the World War II, 1945, that we're starting to build up an American studies environment in, in Norway. And it was uh, Professor Sigmund Skye. After World War II, he actually traveled to antique bookshops in the United States, and he bought literature that he brought with him back home. And that started the library in the American Studies Department. But throughout the 40s and the 50s, and even into the 60s, American studies were not legitimate. It was a little bit dirty. It was like, you know, popular culture. It was English that dominated. And if you went to the teacher colleges, Lærerhøyskole in Norway, you would often find somebody with knowledge about England, but not about America. It means that generations of Norwegians went to school in Norway without getting any solid, proper knowledge about the United States <coughs> at the same time as the United States was establishing its, let's say, power, control of the world, not only military, but also culturally. And uh, in the early 70s, when we discovered that the United States maybe was not exactly what we thought it was, Students at the University of Oslo, they boycotted the education in American studies. They boycotted the lectures to show their opposition toward the Vietnam War, etc., etc. And the reaction was, America is not what we thought it was. But if America was not what we thought it was, what do we do? We don't boycott, we study. We find out what it really is. In 1980, Pax Lexicon, did not find anybody to write the article in Norway about the United States. The editor of that encyclopedia told me that himself. Ole started to study, do American studies at the University of Minnesota at the time when that was not really the thing to do. After my first year in the United States, I came back to Norway and uh, my friend said, Steinar cannot see it objectively anymore. He has been there. <laughs> Meaning, then you have been seduced, then you have been somehow corrupted by this American spirit hidden somewhere, clothed hidden, whereabouts unknown. So, to take United States seriously is actually one of the most important things we should do today, in every aspect. And that's what I mean by Ole being a pioneer. I'm proud to say that we have the same education from the University of Minnesota in uh, American Studies. We even had the same advisor, Professor David Noble, and uh, I'm very happy to give this short introduction to you, Ole. And I'm also proud to say that I think, particularly, you have become the face of American studies in Norway the last 20 years. So congratulations for your effort. Thank you. My dad had heard that, you know, <laughs> and even more so my mother, she would have believed it. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's always nice to get back to uh, Nansen School. 
And I may correct you a little, because when you talk about boycott, not only the American Studies Department, but in History Department and in the Political Science Departments. You know, actually the English Department split into the American Institute and the British Institute. We were the only ones doing American Studies, and we did so for not only uh, till the closure of the Vietnam War, but for 20 more years, until, you know, in the, uh, in, in, in the 90s, uh, the history department and the political science department decided that uh, the United States was house clean. So, uh, so we were actually carrying the load all along there. Well, uh, I uh, was asked to uh, comment on both the Norwegian and the American constitutions. I know the American one best, and I will be speaking mostly about it, also because it was the first and the model for many, many other uh, constitutions. So, um, but I think the title I was given to the Constitution One Idea is a great one because that's really it. And I'll try and, and, and explain what is meant by that. And um, I will be pretty concrete and not very philosophical in my, in my uh, dealings here. Now this is, of course, Washington, D.C., my favorite spot. I'm affiliated with the George Washington University, which is a you stone know, from the White House. And here is the National Archives, where you find the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Emancipation Proclamation, and many other documents. And I'll return to that, because it's a very, very important place for Americans to pilgrimage to, actually. It's, it's, it's an icon, you know, the Constitution. I'll return to that. Here is the Liberty Hall in Philadelphia, where it was made in a very hot summer of, of, 19, oh, of 1787. And uh, when, you know, things looked pretty dark, and it, it, it was steamingly hot in Philadelphia, and it's very muggy there, so uh, everything was going pretty bad for a while. And then a cold norther from Canada swept down and chilled, you know, the heads, and, and that really saved it. And in uh, less than four months, they had the Constitution ready, starting 26th of May, finishing on the 19th of September. The Norwegians, we are known to be pretty slow, but we did it in five weeks. So, but then we had a model, and that makes a difference. Here we have the founding fathers, those who made the Constitution, and that's, of course, a picture you'll find throughout schools and in public buildings and many other places. Here is the Norwegian Storting, uh, which is, of course, the home of, of our government. And here we have Eidsvold building, and where our constitution was made in 1840. <laughs> the American constitution is the oldest one in the world. And we like to think of America as a young nation. And Ronald Reagan was very fond of pointing out that we have the oldest constitution in the world. Um, he didn't say working constitution, because that's a very important thing. There are many other constitutions, but you know, they are not working anymore. So um, we have a lot of common there. Then we have the Eidsvold for Schamlingen, the founding fathers of Norway. And of course, this year will be pretty heavy with uh, commemorations and, and celebrations and what have you. I understand that the Swedish king and queen will come. <laughs> They're changed their mind. I just heard it before I left. <laughs> yeah, you know, thinking that like, there's really still a little time to rethink things. <coughs> here is James Madison, who is often called the father of the American Constitution. And here is Christian Magnus Paulsen, uh, the Norwegian <coughs> father of the Constitution, although he had some good help. Now, after the Constitution of Norway was signed on the 17th of May in the year of Lord, 1814, there was a, 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 on the 19th, his son was baptized in Eisvold Kirke. And you think, could you imagine what he would call his son? He called him Georg Benjamin Paulsen. And of course, Georg for George Washington, and Benjamin for Benjamin Franklin. And that tells us in a one fell swoop, you know, uh, how important the American Constitution and the Founding Fathers were to his among his fathers and, and um, Gunder Adler, who was his, his collaborator. 
This is the American Constitution. We the people, it says on top. And that's exactly the one idea that the Norwegians and the Americans shared when it came to writing the Constitution. From the bottom up, from the grassroots to the top. Not a kind of Constitution by the mercy of God, but by the mercy of the people. And here is the Norwegian uh, Constitution, less impressive perhaps, but still 112 paragraphs, and pretty much, you know, modeled on the, the American. In 1780, <laughs> not in 1780, 1987, I was invited to the bicentennial of the Constitution with a group of uh, Supreme Court justices from the Third World, we were 18 all told, and uh, we had some Filipinos along, and they had been in a recent revolution against Marcos, you know, and they had been part of a writing committee making a new constitution, and it was very much based on the American. So the American constitution is still being used as a model for new constitutions throughout the world. Now, the preamble is by the Supreme Court decision in 1905, <coughs> not part of the Constitution, but it sums up the main ideas in it. But it has no political function, really, or power or force. But it actually brings in um, the, the central idea. And it starts with, we the people. And it's interesting because initially they thought they would enumerate the states, but then Again, you had the back country, where a lot of states had some additional areas between um, the uh, Appalachians and the Mississippi River. And those belong to the states. And there obviously would be new states. So it would be dangerous to limit the Constitution to the existing states. So we the people, that's a marvelous uh, solution to that problem. And then comes the proof of this being a very American document. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, well, you start with perfection, and then you improve on it. That's America. <laughs> you know, an Englishman, if he thinks something is very good, what will he say? Not bad, is it? <laughs> Not bad, is it? That means it's shit up to use the youth idiom. Um, then an American thinks something is fairly good and say, fantastic, and then it'll go up. We have two cultures, one of understatement, one of overstatement. But um, they have made a good case of trying to improve it. And I'll return to that, it needed improvement. Also, there are some other phrases here, like promote the general welfare. Um, and that is a very important thing. Uh, which was later used by, first by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. What does welfare mean? It means a lot of things. Jimmy Carter used it to uh, establish an um, educational department in Washington, because certainly education is part of the welfare, isn't it? So um, it, it's limited, it's, it's, it's indicated here, and we'll return to it uh, later on. And um, at the very bottom there, we have the do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Ordain. You ordain church ministers. It's a sacred document. You know, here we have an indication that this is a very solemn occasion. So they ordained it. And, and that's what they did. Now, American exceptionalism is a very important notion. And now, if you read the newspapers, you'll see the Tea Party people talk about American exceptionalism all the time. And Obama was criticized for not believing in American exceptionalism. He said, yes, I do believe in American exceptionalism, but I think most nations have that idea that they are exceptional. And, um, and uh, so, but the Puritans went to America to start all over again, not to flee actually discrimination in England, but they wanted to go to America because they, you know, the, the religion was not pure enough in England, so they went to America, where the American Adam in a New World Garden would cancel the fall, sin the fall, and start over again, you know, on a clean slate. For don't God, the thing is, if they tell for the season. And this one. Now, Americanism is the American national ideology. 
Americans are proud that they don't have any ideology. But both parties have the same ideology, and that's Americanism. And it's different. I call it a supranationalism. Not that it's super patriotic, but it is super in the meaning on top of. And it spreads across, and it, 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 it embraces the whole nation, and a very diverse nation. Norway is a very, or used to be anyway, very homogeneous, uh, very ill-sorted, whereas the United States is very heterogeneous, a very many-cultured, multicultural uh, nation, of course. And consequently, they cannot claim to share the same ethnic heritage or this a long history. So the base of the nation is actually theoretical principles and values. And I will not go into details about what it consists in, but it's very important. I call this civil religion or political religion. It's a kind of secular religion, which is kind of sacred, but not religious uh, religion proper. It's the oldest working constitution in the world, and I said a model for many, many others. It was the first major republic. You had the Greek uh, republic uh, city-state, but they were minor, of course. And then you had, had the Helvetian one, which was also very minor by American standards. But this was 13 states making up a new system, a republic. And it was, you know, ridiculed by the Brits, of course, but also by other Europeans. It won't last. It won't work, you know, because monarchy was the rule of the day. But um, George Washington was very concerned about this is the first time. We are doing it for the first time. We must do it right. And therefore, he was very concerned about creating a kind of respectful system. And he was very pompous himself, of course, and, and, and actually uh, sold his own uniforms and, and liked the pomp and circumstance. But it was important to show that republicanism was there to stay. The separation of powers was a French idea, of course, Montesquieu, but it was first implemented in America. And we actually adopted that later, not to the same clean uh, deal, but, but pretty much uh, along the same lines. And it is not possible to separate powers completely. So each branch of government was given a certain domain to have most of the power, but then the other two branches had a chance to check that, that power. So we talked about checks and balances. And um, the problem is that it actually means that you presuppose collaboration, cooperation. It's a question of sharing powers rather than separating powers. And that is what the Tea Party people don't understand or at least doesn't seem to understand, that if the system is going to work, people must compromise. I used to tell my students, the American Constitution is based on three principles. And I said, number one is compromise. And they're like, you know, you know students, right? The master's voice. And then I said, the second one is compromise. And then, you know, a few start looking up. And I said, the third one is compromise. And compromise is not a principle. It's a lack of principle. But of course, it is uh, the base for a working arrangement in such, uh, such a situation. William Fulbright, the father of the Fulbright Foundation and the whole program, he, uh, I, I was able to meet him a couple of times, three times actually, and had long discussions with him. He was actually an admirer of the, um, of the um, parliamentary system because that is made to make things work. The American system is made to prevent action. And that is true. Uh, one was so afraid of concentration of power that one wanted to, to see to it that no one branch became too powerful. Can you hear me back there? No. All right. Uh, also, uh, the... Um, the um, problem is, of course, when you have a division or divided government. 
as you have now, with two chambers of Congress fighting one another, and the president being belonging to, to one, uh, and it, then it doesn't work. And uh, Fulbright said, you know, we have the best governmental system in the world. And I thought, well, what else is new, you know? Every, every American will say that. And then he said, the only problem is it doesn't work. <laughs> and that's a, you know, a minor problem, of course. Uh, now, at the bottom of the American system is the Declaration of Independence. And that's a beautiful document. It's an idealistic document with all those highfalutin ideals. We hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal <coughs> and onwards from there. Um, the Constitution is a prosaic document, a kind of blueprint for governing, and it isn't pretty. It is not pretty, and it was certainly not pretty when it was first made. But at the tail end, uh, you know, the thumb of the states wouldn't sign the Constitution unless uh, a Bill of Rights was added. A Bill of Rights protecting people, again the people, against abuse by government, by the authorities. And the first ten amendments are called the Bill of Rights, and this is the basis for most human rights throughout the world, uh, starting with the French Revolution onwards to the Universal uh, Human Rights Declaration by the United Nations in 1948. So it's a very important document. And let me take just the first amendment, which is the major one. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for re a redress of grievances. Now, you have two clauses here dealing with religion. One is the establishment clause, which forbids, which prohibits the establishment of an official public church. Because there were so many, by the time they wrote the Constitution, there were so many Germans, there were so many Dutch, and so on, that they could not create the kind of New England that they had hoped to, to make. And then it's the free exercise clause. The free exercise clause, <coughs> which means that you cannot prohibit people from worshiping the way they want. So you have two sometimes conflicting clauses, but they're very important. And the main point is that the American Constitution had no public church, no official church, no state church uh, at all. And that's a major difference from Norway, of course. And, uh, and that was one of the most controversial things at Eiswold in 1814. The Constitution of Norway, uh, as of today, the revised version reads, the Kingdom of Norway is a free, independent, indivisible, and inalienable realm. Its form of government is a limited and hereditary monarchy. Article 2, which deals with religion, our values, and this is from the 21st of June in the year our Lord, 2012. Take a drink to that. <clears throat> our values will remain our Christian and humanist heritage. This constitution shall ensure dem democracy a state based on the rule of law and human rights. We have a lot of shared values, the two nations. <clears throat> the constitution in both countries is a foundation for the nation. It's a fundament. It's the, it's the, it's the sort of the, the, what it is founded on. And in America, it's, it's an icon. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, a almost sacred, a holy document. And one of the most touching things, when I'm in Washington in the summer, I walk down either Constitution Avenue or uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, on that corner you have the National Archives that we saw initially here. And in there, you know, are those precious documents. And there, are often, there is often a queue outside of pilgrims from North Dakota and Hawaii and where have you you know, they are to see those documents. And what is remarkable, they are silent. You know, Americans being silent when, to, when they are tourists, it's amazing. 
But you know, that car no solemn, car no solemn out of the And you go in, people there in, in very, very um, respectful silence in front of those documents. And it, it's very, it's very touching because the Constitution uh, is one of the few things that has remained pretty stable. In America, where newer is better, bigger is better, not the Constitution. The old one is the best. It's a national icon to be preserved, protected, and defended. And you have a great deal of constitutional conservatism. And the Constitution is not easily changed, and shouldn't be. It takes two thirds of both chambers of Congress to change it. But then it must go to the states to be ratified by three quarters of the states, 38 states. And that's a pretty hard task to get that, you know. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, which was given to be given, giving rights to women on an equal footing with men, was uh, passed by Congress unanimously in 1972, but it was never ratified because then the Reagan Revolution came and there were other ideas about women's place at the kitchen sink. Uh, in Norway, we also have the same kind of veneration for the Constitution but not so openly. I mean, people are concerned about the Constitution, and they're reminded of it every 17th of May, every 17th of May. People talk about the Constitution, but it's not as, as common as in America, but still, it is, is very important. Um, and in the 1830s and 40s, when the Constitution was written before we entered the Union with Sweden, and that's a very important thing because we didn't enter a full real union. We entered a personal union where the king was shared, but you know, we've had our constitution and our government, which is very important. And when the new Swedish king, Carl Johan, uh, later on in the 1820s and 30s, tried to change the constitution, our steward king, our national assembly, unceremoniously rejected any attempt. We talk about uh, constitutional conservatism and the same you find in America. There's quite a bit of constitutional uh, conservatism. Every time one is about to change the constitution, there has have been many attempts because it needs change. And uh, in Congress people agree, yeah, we ought to change it. But when it gets down to voting, they say, let's not tamper with the constitution. Let's not tamper with the Constitution. Leave it alone. Because if we, you know, uh, start tampering with the Constitution, other things might fall apart as well. Uh, of course, it is possible to change it, both, but it's, it's a cumbersome process in both countries. And, but they have been changed. In America, you have amendments added. In Norway, you also have amendments, but they are incorporated in the Constitution Sometimes one is vacated and then the other one will replace it and or is added and it's not in a separate package as the American Bill of Rights and the 27 amendments including the Bill of Rights. It's amazing that after 1791 only 17 times has the Constitution been changed and one was changing it back again so it's actually 15 changes in a nation where newer is better. It's amazing. <laughs> and that tells us something about the thing. Now, the democratic principle, popular sovereignty. <coughs> People rule. That is the main thing in both countries, as I started out by saying. It's a democratic nation, uh, west of the pond, and the same here, east of the pond. But the people is sovereign. Egalitarianism. Americans are very concerned about fairness. So are Norwegians. Freedom and equality. And it was decided in both places, no nobility. The Swedes have noblemen. They have nobility. We never had. And that's another thing we share with the Americans. You know, equality was to mean, egalitarianism was to mean something. And, that, and both nations are born in revolt. The Norwegian. Uh, revolution of 1814 was pretty, well, it was not very bloody, 
uh, the American one, the War of Independence was bloody, but, but after all, they were both establishing two new nations. But these constitutions, when they remain, had their flaws, their weaknesses. And let's deal with the American first. The Great Compromise, of course, the Connecticut Compromise between small and big states. The large states wanted, of course, proportionate uh, uh, representation in Congress, whereas the small states wanted the old system from the Articles of Confederation, which was the first constitution, uh, one vote for each state. Um, now, the compromise was to have a proportionate representation in the House, in the lower chamber, but have two senators from each state in the upper chamber, in the Senate. Now, that has been retained, and still is. And when you know that California has 37 and a half million people, Wyoming has 570,000 people, both states have two senators. If you think along democratic lines, <laughs> that's a weakness. Americans don't really think about it. I mean, the average American, because they are so used to it. But of course, that's horrendously undemocratic. And I'll return to it because actually, in the two latest elections, the Democrats won on a national basis. They won both chambers. But in the 2012 election, where the Democrats won by 1.3 million people across the nation, the Republicans have 34 representatives more in the House than the Democrats, which is, of course, very undemocratic. And that's why the Tea Party can push on the way they do. The Electoral College, which is an indirect way of choosing the president, only in theory, though, uh, using the winner-take-all principle in most states, two states, Nebraska and Maine, have a different system, but basically, if you win one state by one vote, you get all the electors. And again, that's fine, but the problem is that you do drag in the same inequality that you have in the Congress, because the Electoral College consists of both the same number as the total number of congressmen and senators, 538, whereas there are 435 representatives in the House, and there are 435 congressional districts. So why? Wyoming should have had one out of 300, 435. But they have three out of 538, which is almost three times as many as they should have. The small states have really a veto power in both places. And that's a democratic weakness, of course. But the <coughs> worst thing that happened was the three-fifth compromise. The Southerners would not enter into the Union unless the slaves were counted as a basis for their representation in the House of Representatives. The Northerners wouldn't buy that. But the compromise was that, well, a slave is not the whole man, but is three-fifths of a man. So 60% would do. So they counted all white men, you know, in, in who had the right to vote. And then they, count, they, and the, they counted all the, the, the population, I mean, and then the black population, and times three divided by five. That was the color. In return, they had to pay tax on the slaves. You know, these are compromises I'm talking about. And it's not a very pretty one. It took a civil war to do away with it. And uh, that was bloody. 630,000 people died in, or died from, from wounds in that war. Also, from a democratic sense, uh, viewpoint, it is somewhat dubious. Although this has been copied throughout the world, you know, the idea of judicial review that the Supreme Court is recruited by nomination by the president and then um, endorsement by the Senate. And the judges or justices that they are called in the Supreme Court they will serve during good behavior. <laughs> Usually they shape up pretty well. So they can sit forever till they topple over. 
uh, in the appeals courts and the district courts, usually they retire at 70 unless they're asked to continue. I spoke with one very famous uh, judge at the appeals court in Atlanta, who was 98 when he turned him the gavel, you know. But the states, it's a different system. They have elections, which is also kind of dubious, political elections of judges. But this federal system has this appointment. And when you appoint people at a young age, like George W. Bush w. did, then they will sit on and on and on for a long time. There will be a lag, you know, and often that will conflict with the popular will. So that's a democratic deficit, you might say, uh, there, right there. The Norwegian constitution was not very much prettier. And this is the Norwegian text. Let's go to the English. The evangelical Lutheran religion shall be maintained and constitute the established church of the kingdom. The inhabitants who profess the said religion are bound to educate their children in the same. Well, fair enough. Jesuits and monastic orders shall not be tolerated. Jews are furthermore excluded from the kingdom. Now, it wasn't till 1851 that Jews were allowed into this country. It was not until 1897 that holy orders or monastic orders were allowed. And mind you, it wasn't till the year of Lord, 1956, that Jesuits were allowed. Norwegians were scared shitless of, of Jesuits <laughs> because they were so good pedagogues, you know, that they were afraid they would actually uh, take over the whole nation. Uh, it was very embarrassing to the uh, Norwegian ambassador to the United Nations when they signed the Universal Declaration of Rights, Human Rights. And then, of course, from 1948. And Norway still had a prohibition against Jesuits. And we have been told that time and over again. Our ambassadors have been reminded of it. You know, oh yeah, you allow uh, Jesuits now, <coughs> do you? Uh, so, you know, we like to think that we are far ahead when it comes to human rights. Dream on. The oath of the American president. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. I will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. That is, last phrase is not in the oath, but it has been added, and most uh, presidents do add it now. Uh, there's a myth that George Washington said those words. That's not true. And we don't know. Actually, uh, historians have not been able to establish who said it first, because there was no radio reports. And all the same, it's there. And I'll return to it because, of course, so help me, God is certainly religious, isn't it? Uh, which is forbidden by the First Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, two presidents have used the word affirm in the first line there, instead of uh, swear, which is less religious. Um, and um, and um, so that's the case. The Norwegian king, Haakon, um, used this oath in 1905, and King Olaf and Harald used the same later on. I promise and swear that I will govern the kingdom of Norway in accordance with the constitution and laws. So help me God, the almighty and omniscient. And then his motto was all for Norway. And that same motto has been uh, adopted by his son was and, and, and then his grandson. Now, the constitution is, I said, a kind of rough draft or a kind of working um, <coughs> um, system for, 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 for a working uh, system. And um, there is a need for interpretation. And it's the Supreme Court that took upon itself the right in 1803 that they had the right to what we call judicial review. We have also adopted that uh, 
in a, in a relatively mild version. But it means that it is actually the, the uh, judges in the various courts and at the very top, the Supreme Court, who decides what the Constitution means. And there are two basic ways of interpreting the Constitution. It's what they call strict scrutiny uh, or uh, strict interpretation and strict constructionism, as it's also called, and conservative judges will stick to that. And some of the more conservative, like Scalia, will have um, as his ideal originalism, original intent. What did the founding father intend when they wrote the Constitution in 1787? It's a little problematic when you have, for example, helicopters checking into, uh, you know, chemical plants and so on, looking down, because they all only had hot air balloons at that time, and they weren't really navigable. So when the Fourth um, Amendment to the Constitution has a guarantee against unreasonable searches and seizures, that was ransacking it over time, then, you know, uh, it makes a difference when you come in a helicopter. You don't have to enter the building, but you have a pretty good view from there, and so on. So the liberals have loose constructionism as their view, meaning we must we must interpret the constitution in light of the present, as a working constitution this time and age. And this is a quarrel going on in the Supreme Court, and the majority is five to four conservative for the time being. Now, there are certain <clears throat> powers that Congress has that are enumerated, they are specified. And two very important ones, one that Congress should have is to provide for the general welfare. And of course that is, this, remember, to promote the general welfare. In the preamble, here is specified, you know, Congress has the power and the duty to do that. And this was used by, as I said, Roosevelt and, and Carter, and others, not to speak of Lyndon B. Johnson for reforms. Then also there is that Congress has the right to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. This was used by especially the, by the Supreme Court, of course, the, the Warren Court. <coughs> the Warren was a, one of the, our good Norwegians in the United States, well, the greatest chief justice, I think, ever. Um, and the Johnson administration in the desegregation of the South, because, you know, interstate commerce is regulated by Congress. And of course, restaurants, restrooms in, in bus stations and bus depots and so on, were interstate, had interstate affiliation. And this has been used for progressive legislation in the United States, also to pass gun laws, because guns cross borders usually between states, and therefore you can use the Commerce Clause. Obama used the Commerce Clause when he passed his health care reform. But John Roberts, the Chief Justice who wrote the opinion for the Supreme Court, said, no, you know, this is not commerce proper. That's a loose interpretation of commerce, so it doesn't hold water. But, he said, it will survive because the government or Congress has the right to tax people. So it survived that way. And people were really, oh, you know, uh, John Roberts had really turned liberal, my foot. He hadn't. Actually, Obama won the battle, but John Roberts won the war because they had to come, the, the, the Supreme Court limited the reach of the Commerce Clause, which they have been after for 15 years now. That's a very important one. Then we have so-called implied powers. Now, Congress has power to make laws which shall be necessary and proper. And my goodness, what is necessary and proper? No, simple to one. Uh, you know, that could be anything, couldn't it? And that is called the elastic clause. It can be really, you know, stretched according to... And again, that's been criticized by the conservatives 
as you know, not being uh, the original intent of the fathers, founding fathers. Then we have inherent powers, which means that the federal government has certain powers that the state governments don't have. For example, foreign policy belongs to Washington. And then we have concurrent powers. That's powers that the state and the federal government in Washington have. And they're sharing taxing power. You have both state taxes and federal taxes. Norway also has a working constitution because we have to make it work and we have changed it very little. But we have changed it all the same. And the same goes for the United States. There are two ways of changing the Constitution. I told you the formal one, when you change the letter of the law, you change actually the rule. The other one is to interpret it in a new way. That the Supreme Court will interpret the Constitution in a new way. So you don't change the letter of the law, but you change the meaning of the law. And that has happened in both countries, but particularly in Norway where words don't mean what they used to mean. And that we have in our Constitution nothing about the parliamentary system. We have the separation of powers, the checks and balances system, to a certain extent, but not the, the parliamentary system, which means that the government must have a majority in our National Assembly. But it was introduced by the Supreme Court in the year our Lord uh, 1884, and it's stuck. After that, we have a parliamentary system, which means that uh, if there is a majority vote of no confidence by the Stuti against the cabinet or the governing party or coalition, it will bring it down. And that's a major difference. But you know, it's not in the Constitution. It's not reflected in the Constitution. It's a change by custom. And, of course, customary law is, is one of the things that have been used very much in the Norwegian side. And also executive or administrative regulations, further segment, have modified the Constitution. The letters of the Constitution being unchanged. So there's a new Constitution, even if it doesn't look like it. For example, when we say king, when the Constitution say king, it means the government, the cabinet, in most cases. So again, it may, in some, in some paragraph, it actually means uh, the king. But in others, it means the government or the cabinet. This, our Stuting, our National Assembly, has delegated powers to the municipal level, commune, for the Moscow flow, not the Dijon. And the regional level, 1976, Fylke, you know, where the Fylke is commune. Excuse me. We started a little late, so I have 45 minutes. I have a little leeway <coughs> here. What are the major differences between the two cultures? Well, there are quite a few, but one of the popular interpretations is Equal opportunity in America, equal results in Norway. What does it mean? It means that people are different. And some will achieve more than others. In America, you have a very heavy emphasis on individualism. Consequently, they say well, it would be un unfair to really hinder someone from performing uh, in order for others to, to make it up. Um, in Norway, uh, there is a, a greater um, will to see people being equal at the end of life, so to speak, at the end of the, of the run, so to speak. Um, it's, the problem is that equal opportunity is a very fine principle if you have equal opportunity. I read in Washington Post yesterday that now a good many Schools in America, colleges and universities, uh, have tuition and fees and room and board at the level of $60,000 a year, one year in college. And it's not just the most prestigious private colleges, but state universities also. 
And if you multiply by 4, you know, and talk about equal opportunity, my foot. You know, there is no such thing. But I must say, Americans like to, 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 to uh, believe in make believe that I'm um, part of that. I think Lindsay Johnson said it very wisely when he introduced affirmative action in 1965. A affirmative action was a program for minorities to make up for past discrimination. He said, you don't take a person who has been hobbled in chains for years and years and hundreds of years and then take him to the starting line of our race and say, you are now free to compete with all the others who have practiced running for, you know, the same time. So, uh, actually, uh, equal results uh, may be a kind of social democratic overreach in Norway, but certainly equal opportunity does not exist in the United States. But kids are told that in kindergarten that in America we have an equal opportunity. And I've asked many little black kids in, in, in ghetto, pretty squalid uh, environments, do you have equal opportunity in America? Well, yeah. <coughs> That's a main difference. We are more realistic. In a conflict between freedom and equality, and that often happens. If you want more equality, some people must have less freedom. You must, and that means also, of course, redistribution of wealth. When Obama tried that on a very minor scale, it was, you know, called a socialist and, and a European. Um, but, but um, the policy uh, <coughs> generally is that Norwegians go for equality, Americans for freedom, for liberty, if you like. Officially, Norway has an established state church, or had until last year or year before, when the state and the church were separated, formally speaking. But for many, many years, for, you know, <coughs> practice in Norway has been quite secular, both in public and private life. Public ceremonies in Norway only rarely have a religious aspect, although we, you know, have or had a, a state church. We are hypocrites, I guess. Officially, the United States is neutral in the religious matters, but is quite religious, Christian, in both public and private life. Both Congress and the armed forces have chaplains paid for by the federal government in conflict with the First Amendment of the Constitution. We are nonetheless two very similar nations, two idealistic but pragmatic peoples who are both convinced that we live in a country which is the best nation possible in the entire world, and also know very well how other nations should run their affairs. Thank you. Thank you so much Rudy, for uh, your excellent uh, lecture on this topic. Um, it was most informative and enlightening, uh, I'd say. So now we open the floor for questions. Uh, so please be, feel free to lift your hands and give me a signal in your mouth, just to give you the word. And then again, for those of you that came here now at 8, there's been, um, uh, we have communicated to the uh, uh, local newspaper in two versions, one that starts at 8, one that starts at 7. So our deep apologies for that. Um, Sorry. Well, please be. feel free to ask questions. I, I saw the Norwegian television just two, three days ago. Uh, the man who, in our national archive, was uh, protecting the Norwegian Grundlov Constitution. Mm -hmm. And the reporter actually asks him, because he has to go into some kind of a bed. How many times have you seen it? 
and he said twice. Mm. And then you're telling me that there are long lines in front of the National Archive in Washington, D.C. to see the American Constitution, and people are even silent mm. out of some, some respect. So there is a dramatic difference in the role of the Constitution. Mm. And you had a point there. Somehow, Norway, when we talk about ourselves, we feel that we, are, we have been organically developed. It's somehow the Norwegians that slowly made this country. While the United States, in a way, was founded on certain ideas, certain principles, written down in these documents. But is that kind of a stereotypical perception? Or how do you explain that the role of the Constitution is so different in terms of, uh, uh, in the popular mind? Well, I think, uh, I don't think it's that kind of uh, popular or, or a populist or whatever um, interpretation. It's, 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 I think it's, it's very much true that, you know, that in, uh, the United States is a very symbolic nation. Of course, we both come out of the myth and symbol school of Minnesota, uh, and, uh, and um, they are very important. And, and when you see the flag uh, throughout the country in most school rooms, and you see the pictures of the founding fathers, you see, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, state seal. Um, these are symbols of the nation. And remember, again, we t I, I think we tend to underrate the notion that there are 50 states, there are 50 states in the United States, you know, and the federal government is, of course, a kind of overarching uh, phenomenon. And it's very important. And it, from the very beginning, there was a fear that the nation would fall apart. And of course, there have been uh, times, uh, apart from the Civil War, also when that was about to happen, also in 1840, actually in America. But um, but um, the, uh, there are the, these icons, if you like, uh, are, are very symbolic. And that's, I think that's very true, that one is so afraid of changing the Constitution too much and changing the system too much. Because one first, one is convinced that it's the best one in the world. Second, that if you start tampering with this, you know, it's one of the basic foundations. Because America is so, in many ways, so uh, diverse. And there are so many, and it, it's so flexible, and it, it, it's so uh, unstable, if you like. There is a dynamic forces all the time in, in the most aspects of life. And there's a lot of Americans move much more than, you know, uh, every five years uh, an American will move on an average. Um, so it's important to have certain things that are steady and fast and permanent. Um, when, you, when we talk about the Constitution, um, it's true that it's seen more often. And it's protected by bulletproof glass, you know, plexiglass, and by guards. And it's lowered into the floor every night in fireproof walls. You know, and so that, you know, it, 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 it's a very, very dear and very, very important. And, and, and very important. <coughs> um, but, I mean, that's why uh, um, I say Americanism is a, a kind of civil religion. It's a political religion. Uh, there is so much um, quasi-religion in, in American life, uh, which uh, actually is uh, part of that Americanism that I talk about. Well, the ingredients in Americanism is, of course, first of all, patriotism, and then it's individualism, then it's free market, free enterprise system, and then also a kind of watered down Protestantism, which is so diluted that even Catholics and Jews can be part of it. It's a kind of secular, and it, 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 it's, uh, we call it political religion or civil religion. Um, but it, it's religious in tone. And uh, so the Constitution, which is really the foundation, uh, takes on that kind of sacred dimension. And also the flag. Um, there have been many cases, of course, of of um, flags being violated 
Um, uh, during the, civil, the <coughs> Vietnam War, uh, protesters would urinate on the flag uh, and, and, you know, burn the flag. And, you think, and of course, uh, the Supreme Court in the 1980s, two times in the late 80s, <coughs> by a conservative majority, upheld the right to actually violate the flag. Uh, so the freedom <coughs> of speech was more important. But all the same, most people would, would respond very negatively to tampering with the flag. Uh, I think uh, if we look at Norwegians, uh, we are waving the flag even more than Americans. If you look at the sports events, you know, it's all. And I must say, I, I don't particularly like that their butts are decorated, you know, the, the, the athletes' butts are decorated with Norwegian flag. I, I, I don't <coughs> think that's in a bad form, you know. But uh, and the same is in America, that the use of the flag, which you also see in there, in, in, in the kind of most secular way, um, is, is frowned upon by most people because the feel like it violates uh, something sacred. Um, I, I, I don't have any better answer to your question. Really. Yeah, but um, but uh, I must say, I, I worked with, for many years, uh, most of my 31 years at the university, I, I studied the relationship between minorities and the mainstream in a legal context, uh, the Supreme Court being my, my specialty. And um, I came out of that experience convinced that Americanism, national ideology, American nationalism is, is the far most important uh, aspect of American life, which is often underrated in Europe. When I was uh, teaching at the University of Minnesota in the American Studies program, I taught individualism in American life. We had three basic pillars that we taught for freshmen, and that was individualism, religion, and nationalism. The three pillars. And uh, they are very important, I, I think, in, in, in this very context. Uh, I must also say, when we talk about the Constitution, um, the Supreme Court uh, is, is a well-known entity in America. I would be hard put to name the members of the Supreme Court in Norway, I must admit. But in America, you know, at the kitchen table, uh, people will be able to mention a couple of people, uh, a couple of these. Uh, it, it's kind of a very important institution that is a guard dog uh, watching the constitution. That was a long answer. Yes, please. Uh, when we talk about democracy today, we think one man, one vote. We know that the 1814 Bill was just a small minority that was allowed to vote. How was it in the first? Uh, Constitution it, in the US. It was in the United States too. It was left to the states to decide, you know, the right to vote. And uh, actually, one well, started pretty early. Wyoming started in 1869 giving the vote to women. And Wyoming is not a very progressive state, but they needed the vote of the women <laughs> for law and order. So that was the reason. But I mean, the women got the vote in 1920. In Norway, it was 1913. Uh, in Norway, with general male vote, uh, suffrage in 1898. Um, in America, it was up to, one wanted quality citizens. So you also, there were qualifications like property. In the same way, in Norway, we had Mühlmannsvesene. People bought one square uh, meter of, of land in Westerdal. You know, all of a sudden they had a vote uh, because they own property. Uh, the same thing is up to the states to a certain extent. But, um, but to begin with, uh, it was the property class, of course, that had, had the right to work. Let me, let me show you one thing which, you know, which illustrates that we haven't gotten all that far. This was from the election in the year our Lord 2012 for the House of Representatives in the United States of America. Because of something we call gerrymandering, 
Gerrymandering is that you manipulate the, the borders of an election district. Because Congress has 435 seats. That's not changed. But the population grows. Therefore, you have to shuffle, reshuffle between the states. We call it reapportionment. Some states will lose after one um, census, Folketain, every 10 years, 2010. You know, and in, in some states, uh, some states will gain. And inside those states, you have to reshuffle the, the borders. Now, that party, which is in control of state assembly, also has a majority on the commission drawing the lines. And today, we have so much information because of the data technology. That's <coughs> where the Democrats and the, the, and the, and the, uh, the Republicans live. I, I was with a, a Democratic group last year uh, during the election, the year before last, uh, in Virginia. And I was amazed with from door to door to call people out uh, on the election day. Um, I was amazed to see how much, you know, those people knew about each single individual there. But anyway, uh, the thing is that you don't want to win a, a you have a, you know, you have a single member constituency that, you know, one, one representative from each election district. You don't want to win by 70%. You want to win by 53, 54. Now, what about the rest? You shuffle them over into the next. And then you get 55, 53 there also. You follow me? But the, the surplus, you, you push into the next again. And then if you can't help it, you give the enemy as much, you know, I give them one vote, uh, one, one uh, delegate, but you shove so many as possible into that election district. Many black districts in the South uh, have 80% uh, victories, you know. That's a lot of wasted votes. Because of this, um, that's why the Republicans can have 34 people more in their House of Representatives, even if on a national basis, they had 1.3 million less. In these states, as I show you here, uh, Republicans were in control, and they are masters now at uh, doing what we call gerrymandering, manipulation. If you take Wisconsin, for to elect one representative on the Democratic side. Uh, on, the, on the Republican side, you need one and a half, you know, in the in, in terms of, of numbers. If you go to North Carolina, which is which is the most horrendous one, actually in North Carolina, the Democrats won the states in the congressional election, but you Democrats needed three times as many, a little more than three, three point one, for each. Republican, that one. Let me go back and show you here. If you see North Carolina, there was a slight majority of, of uh, Democrats, but, and there are Republicans, but when it came to distribution of representatives, you see the Republicans got that much, the Democrats. Uh, Wisconsin, 53% voted Democratic in the House election, but you see, they are a clear major minority. So uh, this is what we call a deficit of democracy. But why is it accepted, or why is it going on? Um, it's very hard to change, and um, and um, of course this is a problem now because. Um, the Tea Party people, who have been in the driver's seat, actually a minority, that has dominated the Republican House, they have challenged moderate Republicans. There are no moderate Republicans anymore. You know, they're only conservatives. And these people come from, from election districts where Romney, last year, 94 of them, came from election district that Romney won by 60%. They are safe. They can do anything, you know, in Congress, and they will not be punished by the voters. 
they are afraid of being challenged from the right, from conservatives, not from liberal democrats. In 2008, 63 Democrats came in on the, co on the coattails of Obama, you know, from states that McCain won as a presidential candidate, Obama lost. But all the same, Democrats were elected from many of those election districts. There were 63 who came from such districts, we call them blue dogs. Blue dogs are dogs who are not allowed into the house. You know. <laughs> now, in 2012, that number has dwindled from 63 to 15. That means that they are not afraid of being, being um, ousted by Democrats. Let me take one more example. Uh, the health care law was passed in the House in, on 26th of uh, November 2009 by 220 against 215 votes in the House. Everybody was there. That's five, a margin of five. And people say, well, that was a clean slate, a clean shame, you know. At this. So we cut them all the and we see it in line. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leader of the House, because both houses were in, in, in Democratic hands then, she told the blue dogs who came from Republican districts, oh, you come from a very difficult place, you know. You, because in the House you are up for election every two years. You can't go back and say, well, I voted for that darn socialist uh, Obama, you know, that health reform. You haven't got a chance in re-election uh, in 2010. So you vote against. You come from a fairly safe, you, you can vote for. And she said, I want five. I want five as a margin. And damn it, you got five as a margin. <laughs> so it passed by 20, 20 but, but all the same, uh, 28 of the Blue Dogs went out in the, in the election in 2010. So this is why it's so difficult. Democrats don't have a snowball's chance in hell, excuse me, you know, to win the election for the House in the 2014 election, I don't think, because of this. And it's very <coughs> Another thing is, of course, you have the, uh, you have the system of winner-take-all, which may elect a minority president the way you did in 2000 when Al Gore won 545,000 more votes than George Bush but still lost the election because it's the electoral college that counts. Uh, Nebraska and Maine has a different system. They will <coughs> allow one uh, elector from each congressional district the winner will, you know, be allowed, will, will be allotted to, to the winning in the world. And then two to those who win the whole state. That's a little improvement. In 2008, Colorado started a different system. Say, let's use a proportionate, a proportion system. The voters rejected it, 45 to 45, 55 percent. Didn't want it. But, of course, if you are to change it, you must do it at the same time. Because otherwise, you know, um, that Republicans or who win Texas all the time, um, if you change it, of course, they will lose a lot of, of, of votes, not to speak of the Democrats who win California and New York. So <laughs> because then it will be, 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 be lopsided. Um, that's another negative thing. I a lot of negative things there, but but you know it, it, it's important. Um, California now goes Democratic in presidential elections. New York does the same. Texas goes Republican. That means that the candidates don't campaign in these states. It's no use. <coughs> Eighty-two million people in those states are not exposed to real campaigning. 
And those are the most important states in the Union. <clears throat> That's a democratic deficit. So the system isn't very good. Of course, in this country, we have now uh, changed our system from 150 uh, Stortingsmen to 169 in that you have an equalizing system that will shuffle and, and, and make it more. Uh, we also had a single member constituent for a while, but left it. Yeah, I'm... Christian uh, Fredrik. Christian Fredrik, that sounds like... Uh, <laughs> uh, to me, this is... I, I find this really... This is not... Like, like I said before, um, this is not democratic at all. And go oh, to me. I, I, not, I, I, don't, I don't find this democratic at all, no. uh, like you said before. But it's so obvious to me that it, that it's not fair. Uh, do you think the possibility of changing the the constitution would help to this, even if it's possible? Actually, you don't need to change the constitution here. It's it's enough to with it because it, uh, it it says that you must have electors. But how you make that, you know, it's up to the states. So you don't need actually a constitutional change, thank goodness. But to, to make all the states agree that now we'll shift gear, you know, there are so many uh, opposing interests here that it's pretty hard to, 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 to see how it could happen. Um, the Republicans uh, are realizing now that, or I mean the Tea Party branch of it, they are realizing that they are really trying to, to maintain a white, basically male America in control. And they are trying their darndest to, to, to prevent minorities from, from getting, now we have ID, you know, uh, uh, requirements and so on. And um, in Virginia, one state senator proposed that because Obama won Virginia, but not only that, the governor now uh, was also democratic, or a, new, a Democrat won the election. And that's the first time since 1964. Um, so Demo uh, Virginia has been a Republican country for, for a long time, and, 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 and they don't like that. But of course, one of the problems there with the system is that the Republicans live in the country, the Democrats live in the city. You know, they are in the heavily populated areas, and that's why you get these, uh, these surpluses, you know, in terms of votes. And um, in Virginia, um, the um, Republicans won more election districts, but the, uh, in the presidential election, uh, the, the, uh, the vote went the other way, of course. Now, one state senator proposed that uh, that you should give the um, winner of each election district uh, 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 um, an elector. And then, uh, you know, the winner um, of uh, the whole of that should, should be uh, given to, or the winner in each, each election district should, should, should be given the, the um, the uh, electoral, that means that they want more districts, they would have more electors. Of course, this is horrendous. It would be even worse than anything. And it didn't fly, actually, with the Republican leadership in the, in the, in the state. It was too outrageous. But I mean, the, Repub the Republican Party has changed. I mean, uh, it, we tend to forget, but when Lindbergh Johnson passed all that progressive legislation in the 1960s pertaining to poor people, to non-whites, it was thanks to Republicans. Because the South was quite democratic, solid South. And they opposed any kind of movement in that direction. And they had control of all the committees in Congress almost. <coughs> only a labor committee that was uh, available for, for the president. And it was moderate Republicans who actually carried the day. Lindbergh Johnson phoned the Senate chamber to Everett Dirksen, the leader of the minority of Republicans from Illinois, on an ordinary payphone, you know, in, in, in the chamber. And 
Dirksen was running to the phone, and he got the word from the president, you do this, you do that. If you get that law through, you'll get all the credit. If you don't, you get all the shit. <laughs> it's passed. But there are no, there are no moderate Republicans anymore. Richard Luger of Indiana, a very respectable foreign policy uh, expert, was ousted by a Tea Party person last election. Uh, the same happened in Colorado. Uh, now I see the same thing happen in the moderate, uh, Republic, uh, moderate uh, Democrats are out. Uh, today's uh, Washington Post mentions that there are only 15 left of moderate Republicans, uh, of moderate uh, Democrats. They are moving to the left, whereas the Republicans are moving to the right. And you have a divided nation more so than you have had, you know, in, in modern times, unfortunately. Yeah, it's sad. Actually sad. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think you're given a very good presentation of the discrepancy between the ideal, which is we the people. Yes. And then you show the practice, which is it's not we the people who decide. It's actually something else. Mm -hmm. And um, when the United States is somehow trying to shape the world according to its own standards, it defines elections as a very important part of introducing a democratic state. So it's kind of argued that the United States is not only introducing, it's, push, it's pushing elections in Afghanistan, in Bosnia Herzegovina, in different places of the world, somehow to make order. What you are telling us is that actually the American elections themselves have so many flaws that if this is part of the system, they're somewhat introducing or pushing on others. We have we have a serious problem. And I have a, um, I, I sometimes thought that Obama or the president of the United States, he doesn't have a lot of power in each state. The differences between Minnesota and Arizona are so big, so obviously it's the state government that make a lot of decisions. While the American president has a lot of power in the world. So all citizens of the world should actually have a vote when it comes to the American president. <laughs> oh, no, we should anyway. Well, but uh, uh, when we go back in time, we, we know there has been fraud. Even uh, Kennedy probably didn't really win the election against Nixon. He, he won it on stolen votes in the state of Illinois. But recently, I'm saying, did George Bush win the election, or did he actually steal the votes and was elected on false uh, grounds? He stole the election twice, 2000 to 2004, actually. That's very dramatic. And it's been proven. But, I mean, Americans are, are uh, you know, are very forward-looking, and they don't like to, to uh, they prefer to let very dogs lie. They don't want to look back and say, let's move forward. <coughs> You know, and, and that's a nice, a very good attitude. But of course, uh, learning from past mistakes is a good thing too. But uh, Jimmy Carter, who has now been restored to, to, to the status of a statesman, um, traveled the world, of course, as a, as a referee in elections in, in new democracies. And he said uh, about the election in 2000, no developing country would accept that kind of thing. And of course, both the Russians and almost Castro said, uh, would you want us to help you? <laughs> well, it was declined. But anyway, it was, remember, in Florida, the state was decided by 537 votes. The Supreme Court stopped, of course, recounting, and gave the gave the the election to George Bush. In many election districts, there were wasted votes in the thousands. In one election district, there were 25,000 votes they wasted. And you remember, you know, you had these, uh, these, uh, ele uh, these voting machines that you have a style on, you know, and sometimes you push a style through a hole and, and it's perforated. And uh, you had a pregnant Chad, was the word, you know? Chad. A Chad, pregnant Chad was one which was, had not been perforated. And, and then the hanging Chad that was hanging by one corner and so on. 
and people sat there watching, you know, is this, and there were bipartisan commissions and, um, and going through this. Um, and uh, so many votes were, were, were wasted. And of course then you had the butterfly, the blood butterfly um, ballot in, 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 um, in Florida too, in, in West Palm Beach. The butterfly, the butterfly, I, should, I have it on a different little slide, but the butterfly um, ballot was designed by a Democrat, a lady who would make it easy for elderly people. So she put everything on the same sheet. They didn't have to leave over. And you had the names then of George Bush, Cheney, and Al Gore, <coughs> and, and Lieberman. And, and on the right, you had um, Patrick Buchanan, who was for the, um, for the Libertarian Party. No, for the, um, anyway. Uh, on the right hand. So uh, there is that, there are these markers where you put your style through, suit, through the hole to indicate where you choose. Well, they, this is a very democratic, uh, a non white election district. They didn't want George Bush for anything in the world. So, no, you know, the first hole for the two, for the two uh, Republicans was out. So they went to the next one. But that was not Al Gore and Lieberman, but it was Patrick Buchanan and his cover. So that Pat Buchanan won 3,000 votes, more than 3,000 votes in that. And last time around, he had some 47. And he said, they are not my votes. I mean, you know that the end result was 537. It's somewhat relevant. Uh, in 2004, in, uh, in Ohio, Ohio was stolen. Really. There were three commissions that went after that and checked, and one congressional, and it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> but again, nothing happened. Also, you know, there they had manipulated the computers so that people pushed, uh, you know, uh, uh, John Kerry. Um, and up came George Bush, and that happened time and again. And it turned out that this uh, this computer company was in cahoots with uh, the Republican Party. So um, this is it's very sad. Uh, the Republicans used to be the party of morality and politics. You know, Democrats had a, a reputation of being pretty shady. They controlled the cities. And uh, they had a lot of fraud. I mean, dead people voted, dogs voted, you know. Uh, one city boss said, vote early and vote often. <laughs> uh, but now it's the other way around. Now it's actually, there are, there are some squads coming up from Texas to ha harass people. And in Arizona, in the new law there, the, where you require an identity card with a picture, there is also a right to a citizen to challenge a fellow citizen. That means that's another word for harassing. So um, there is that kind of, of uh, discrepancy between the ideal and, and, and that's the problem. Uh, Gunnar Myrdal said it, you know, when it comes to, uh, he, he wrote about the American dilemma. He said that was, of course, slavery and the aftermath of slavery. But it wasn't only that. It was the discrepancy between ideals and reality. And an unfortunate sticks. I'm not saying we don't have it, but we don't have it to the same degree. <laughs> I'm afraid we have to... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, could you just briefly explain what the Norwegian... Um, like division system is and stuff? Like, do you guys have districts that then vote? Proportionate. We have proportionate uh, allocation of, of uh, uh, votes to the individual. So that, you know, you get the relative, the same percentage of the representatives as you get of the, of the um, uh, votes. So uh, our system is far from, from uh, perfect, but it is far more. Uh, but 
I mean, the Anglo-Saxon system is the single member constituency. They, you know, the Americans inherited the system from the Brits. And it was conventional wisdom that you would have a two-party system as a result of that. Because it's very hard for a third party to gain a majority. In England, they have succeeded doing that because of really geographical uh, weight of certain parties. You know, they are strong in certain areas, and therefore they have been able to, you know, the third uh, Lib Lab uh, have been able to, to vote in their people. But uh, that's not the case in America. You don't have that kind of regional difference uh, in, in that sense. You have the regional difference in that the South, which was solidly democratic up to the 1970s, is now solidly Republican. The old Dixiecrats are Republican now. Uh, so you have a regional thing. But, uh, but you don't have that, that third party uh, thing. In um, 1892, the populists, the People's Party, uh, were a strong force in Kansas, Nebraska, and uh, Minnesota, and uh, other places too. Uh, Mary Killey, one of the more radical populists said, raise less corn and more hell, <laughs> you know, because she wanted to change things. But uh, since then, we haven't had the regional, regional uh, at the national level. But uh, in this country, we have this popular. We had for a while a single member constituencies, but people weren't happy with it, so it was actually uh, abandoned. Well, I'm taking too much time. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, in America, it's like arguable that like state elections usually run um, largely democratically and efficiently. Do you think that maybe Norway's um, geographical and population size um, help make the elections run smoother? I mean, no. um, does Norway's geographical and population size make its elections easier? Than oh yeah. Oh yeah. America. Oh, it's very important, but it is you know one of the drawbacks there. Uh, we Norwegians tend to under uh, estimate the importance of states, of course, in America. We think of Norway, America, one on one. <laughs> uh, you know, Americans are basically Minnesotans or Wisconsinites and or, or, or Virginians, and, or even they are New Yorkers, you know, in, in terms of New York City. Uh, they are even local, municipal. Um, people or the states. They are not the national, I mean the federation. It's only when they get outside the United States that they become patriotic, patriotic you know. And um, of course it's up to the states. It's left to the states to decide on suffrage, on voting rights and so on. That makes it very diverse, but it makes it difficult to uh, get a kind of fair and balanced system throughout the nation. And many political scientists and, uh, criticize that. They say we must nationalize the elections for Congress and the president uh, because we have to have uniform. We saw it in 2000 uh, when you know they sat in, in Florida uh, looking at those chads and, and some, in some election districts they would be pretty, you know, they would be more to give more leeway, others were more strict. They didn't have the same. And then uh, Jim Baker of the Republican, you know, said, "Oh, this is not fair. You know, you can't. Uh, this is very, very irrational. You can't continue to stop it." And the Supreme Court stopped it. But of course, that has been the system all along. <coughs> uh, and um, it's it's also a problem that in Ohio, for example, in, in posh districts, in, in rich, you know, well. Wealthy districts, you have computer touch screen computers. In in uh, in some of the poor districts, people stood seven hours in the rain waiting to vote because they didn't have enough capacity and they didn't have modern computers. So so uh, leaving it to the states is has a drawback, and uh, but it's pretty hard to change. I mean, also because the party in, in 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 the driver's seat, be it Republican or Democrats could always hang on to the system and got them there. And, uh, and uh, so this is, this is uh, a problem. But as I see it now, I'm very pessimistic about the, uh, the situation when, uh, when uh, the notion of goodwill 
has really died. Um, it was Newt Gingrich who established this kind of warfare in Congress. I, I go to Congress and speak to Congress and say, oh, it's terrible in Congress, you know, it's, it's so, the, the, the environment is so bad, uh, the atmosphere is so bad, there's no, no rapport between, uh, across the aisle, and um, Washington isn't what it used to be. And another thing in Washington is also that there are a lot of women in Congress now. And of course, women always make problems. Uh, why? Yes, because in the old days, when you were elected to Congress, you moved to Washington. And you didn't ask your wife if she would go, gee, better come along. Now, uh, you know, a lot of women have uh, a profession of their own. They can't go to Washington. They, they are not so willing to. So the man goes to Washington and commutes back home every week. And Friday, you know, in Congress is dead. I mean, it's a four-day week. Obama said, I'll, I'll reestablish a five-week work week. That's happened. And what is, happens also is that in the old days, you lived in Washington. Kids went to school there. You had to socialize. And people would mingle. And over a glass of cognac, you know, uh, a lot of cut, deals were cut. A lot of the after all, there's no social life in, in Congress anymore, people complain. So actually, in the old days, you know, uh, Ken, Kennedy, one of the most liberal uh, senators, was a great pal with Barry Goldwater, one of the most conservatives. They were good friends. They disagreed on most things, but they agreed on being civilized. Uh, Paul Wellstone of Minnesota, who unfortunately died in a, car, in a flight crash a few years ago, he was the most liberal. He was a very good friend with Jesse Helms of North Carolina. Jesse Helms, who was one step left of Genghis Khan. <laughs> they could socialize. They don't anymore. So uh, this has actually uh, impoverished the social life and also the possibilities or opportunities for negotiation and compromise. And those um, Tea Party people, they don't want to compromise. That's lack of stamina. That's lack of backbone. And if they lose the election, so be it. We are here to clean out the mess, not to be reelected. So it's the first time in ever in history that this has happened. And, and um, I just read a book which came out a couple of years ago, actually, but came on the paper about last year, by, uh, by Norman Ornstein, a very conservative uh, scholar on the, in, the, um, in the American Enterprise Institute, along with um, a very liberal one from, from another thing. Right? They have written a book, It's Worse Than It Even Looks. It's even worse than it looks. And he gives the blame, and he is a pretty conservative rep Republican. He says, you know, the rep Republicans really are to blame for this. And I mean, not all Republicans, but those in Congress now, they are a different breed. And they read the Constitution. Uh, when they got in after the really elected, great elect, landslide election in 2010, the first thing they did when they got into Congress, they started reading the Constitution. It was the first time they read it, I guess. But their Constitution is the Constitution of 1787. Not the Constitution that was changed by the Civil War. And I haven't said it so far, but it's obvious that there's a great deal of racism in there especially the Tea Party. And the majority is made uh, up of white males past 45. <laughs> well, I'm making this into a monologue. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, um, I learned about a little bit of the king, too, in Norway. And I've, I've always talked about this at home, too, talking about, especially the British king and queen um, and the monarchy. With, I've, I've learned that the Norwegian king doesn't actually possess a lot of real direct power. 
And I, my main question that I've always been asked too is, well, why do you keep a king? Like, what's the fascination with the king if he Good can't question. do anything? Good question. I think there is no short answer. But one of the reasons why it was went for a king at Aids Hall in 1840 was that one didn't want to copy uh, the Americans and the French. You know, going all that uh, radically. Uh, 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 or, uh, radical way. Um, so um, the uh, argument was that uh, we should stick with tradition. <coughs> but there was a, there were Republicans there uh, who wanted, you know, do with the king too. But again, this was uh, again a compromise. You know, uh, one had to be careful, and of course, to have the constitution accepted, especially by the Brits. That was very important. Without the Brits, we wouldn't have a constitution. But, you know, uh, so if we had, uh, you know, put forward a constitution which was a republic, um, then the Brits wouldn't have bought that. So they were pretty pragmatic, uh, and you might say prosaic uh, compromise. I think that's the main reason for that to happen from the beginning. In 1905, when they broke away from Sweden, King uh, Haakon VII, who became the new king, he didn't want to become king unless the Norwegian population voted. And there was an, you know, more than 85% in favor of monarchy. And then he accepted the kingdom. So, um, and then I think it, a very important thing happened also later on. In the 1920s, the Labour Party in Norway was very radical. They were, you know, part of the Communist International. But in 1928, after a Supreme Court um, uh, trial, uh, the conservative government was deposed, and the uh, outgoing premier asked the king to ask, you know, another uh, conservative or should say centrist uh, leader to take over, but then the king went to the Labour Party, which was the winner of the election uh, that year, Christopher Wunschut, and asked him. And I think that really was a symbolic change, you know. The king actually uh, became popular among the radicals uh, at that time. And then, of course, World War II was very important. He was the one who, in many ways, saved our country because it stood steadfast against the German demands. So um, the king of Norway is very popular. And he doesn't have any power. That's the second part of your question. <laughs> As I said, when you say the king, it's usually the cabinet or the, or the government. So he has lost most of his power. He's just a symbolic figure. He's a head of state, but he's uh, just a, a symbolic figure. But he is a unifying figure. And of course, Again, that's a, maybe a good thing that you have that kind of stability. You don't change the leader every year, every four years. Um, in most republics, you have both a president and a prime minister. In France, in Finland, in Iceland, not so in in uh, America. The president in America is an elected king and is also a prime minister. That's unique for the United States. The problem is that every four years he's up for election. And that's why Watergate was so terrible for Americans. I lived in America then, and people are really afraid that the whole nation would sort of collapse. Because it wasn't just the prime minister who was asked to leave. When Nixon left, it was the king, actually, who had to step down from the throne. And that I think most Norwegians did not get that point. But it was a very traumatic thing for the American population to see that the symbolic head of the nation had defamed himself in such a way that he had to take his leave. Well, <coughs> I was going to apologize for the old time you have to run to the train. Thank you, uh, Ole, and uh, to all of you. A small uh, anecdote at the end, we were talking about these symbolic uh, documents 
Declaration of uh, Independence was signed on the 4th of July, 1776. The first man to sign was Thomas Jefferson. He died 4th of July, 1826, exactly 50 years after. The second man to sign the Declaration of Independence was John Adams. When did he die? The same day, 4th of July, 1826, exactly 50 years later. Ulla, that's, the, said, that's what you learn in the Mitten Symbol School. And he said, Thomas Jefferson is still holding on, he said, but he had already died. I, not to, you know, to, 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 to top your thing, but I was born on King Harkon's birthday in 1940, after the king had gone to England. But the thing is, when I got married, my wife was born on the Queen's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be royal. <laughs> <laughs>